Um, our quote for this meeting is, an incident is just the tip of the iceberg, a sign of a much larger problem below the surface by Don Brown. And let's go ahead and start roll call. Um, all right, so um, the purpose of this is to make sure that everybody can participate in this meeting, can be heard, and can hear one another. Um, so, Kelly? Yes, Kelly Lynch McMahon, Director of Facilities, FUSD. Great. Um, Larry? Yes, I'm here. Uh, Vanner, um, Program Director. Great. Uh, Mary? Mary Vigil? Could you unmute so that we can make here. sure? Here. Sorry, Great. here. No problem. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Law? I'm here. Great. Thank you. Uh, Diane Jones? Here. Board Trustee. Thank you, Trustee. Uh, Brian Gebhardt? Uh, here. Great. Uh, Liz Fisher? Here. Thank you. Uh, Judy Nye? Here. Great. Um, and Luis is handling our streaming. Thank you, Luis. Um, Sharon? Here. Thank you. Uh, Brian? Brian Kilgore? I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Maria Santos, uh, she's our new uh, surf representative. Hi, Maria. Can you say hello? Oh, hi. Sorry. I guess I didn't know if it was working. Oh, no problem. Great. Uh, Henry Fung? Here. Great. Thank you. Robert? Here. Pond? Here. Thank you. And Connie? Um, I'm Connie Town with Vanner Construction. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, so I'll entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. I'll move. Great. Um, and I believe Brian seconded. Um, so let's go ahead and try our voting out again, because you know, I forget after enough time. So if you go to participants at the bottom, you should be able to then raise your hand. So all in favor of adopting, uh, please lower your hands for now. All right. All in favor of adopting the agenda, please raise your hand. And I'll just remind everybody that only members vote. Great. Um, please lower your hands. All opposed? All right, the ayes have it. The agenda is adopted as written. Now we'll move on to the approval of the minutes. Um, and these are the minutes for the July 1st meeting. Can I entertain a motion? I move to approve the minutes. Great. Do I have a second? I will second them. All right, so motion by Liz Fisher, seconded by Mary Vigil. Um, so all in favor of approving the minutes, please raise your digital hand. All right, please lower your hands. All opposed? All right, the ayes have it. Um, so the minutes are adopted as written. And now we'll move to oral and written communications. Apologies, let me see if I can just pull it up. I'm going to go ahead and check the inbox. Um, I don't believe any members of the public have joined us. There is a comment in our inbox, um, and I'll go ahead and read it now. It's by Zuyan Khan, our, our surfboard uh, student board um, trustee. I hope you're doing well, enjoying your summer. I'm reaching out to confirm that next year's FAC will need one surf member to serve on your committee. Please let me know if the number of desired surf delegates has changed. We'll email you the names and contact information of our members later in the month if your committee still needs surf members for the 2021 school year. Um, so without responding to that comment, again, I'd like to introduce everybody to, um, oh boy, I just lost the name, Malia, um, who is joining us from CERF. 
And that is all for public comment. So we can go ahead and move to a, re um, a request for 7-Eleven committee members. Um, Kelly, should I pass the mic to you? That's fine. I just had a question. What is, what's the acronym SURF stand for? I'm sorry, Kelly, that is out of order since it's not your main <laughs> topic. <laughs> no, <laughs> do you want to go ahead? I'm sorry. Um, 7-Eleven committee. So we have now received uh, sufficient applications for the formal formation, reformation of a 7-Eleven committee that will be moving forward to the board for approval on August 24th. And at that time, once that committee is accepted and approved, we will then move forward into establishing um, the identification of the group. And our legal team is then also preparing the um, charge of the group and tasks that we have to accomplish over the next academic year of 2021, since 1920 is basically closed. So that's all I have to report on 7-Eleven. Thank you. Um, and real quickly, it's Students Unified for the Representation of the Fremont Board of Education. Unified. All right, now we can move to the staff update of facility. Can I ask a question on the 7-Eleven item? Yeah, go ahead. Very brief. Uh, I, I just wanted to reconfirm the, the scope, just the Marshall site. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, right now, I have not been given any information in terms of which sites we're going to be evaluating. So once we have the committee formed, I'll be informed as to what our charge is based on what the board directs us to do. Okay, so my, my recollection of the board direction was I thought it was just the Marshall site. So I'm just trying to um, understand how that might evolve and how those decisions I, are Unfortunately, made. I don't have any more information other than that to share with you all. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Yeah, at least the news from 2019 was um, referring to potential uses for the Marshall site in particular. But yeah, I'll, we'll wait for future updates, um, whether that includes other sites. Okay, so now we can go ahead and move to the review of staff update on um, on facilities. So I'll hand it back to Kelly. Okay, so let me pull my own little note. Oh, I'm sorry, Kelly, just one second. Diane, what, did you have another, did you have a comment on, I didn't. I yeah, I did. I, I just wanted to say that um, while I think it was the intention of the board to look just at the Marshall side at the time, with the COVID pandemic, there were some provisions about districts being able to sell property and use funds in a way that we normally wouldn't be allowed to. So, uh, you know, there are things that have changed since that direction was given that might change the scope of the 7-Eleven committee moving forward. So I assume we will be discussing that, but given the change that the governor has given us about what we can do with money that we, get from selling property, it, it might change things. Thank you, and that does remind me. Um, so please raise your digital hand um, if you would like to make a comment or raise a question. If I, for some reason, skip past, um, then feel free to unmute and, and remind me, but I'll try to keep track of the participants stuff. Uh, Brian? Just to reflect back to make sure I understand, so then uh, the board may uh, to be discussing the scope of the 7-Eleven committee in addition to forming, forming it at the August 24th meeting. It would have to be board direction to, to right. change the charge. I believe so, yes. Thank you. Okay, seeing no one further, now we'll move to the staff update on facilities. Okay, well, I don't really have a whole lot that has changed from when we met in July, other than that we are making progress on our projects that are currently under construction. Um, at our last board meeting, the board approved the uh, schedule extension for the Hopkins project, which was impacted by, and is still being impacted by DSA approval and um, some, some issues in terms of our back check process that are causing us to extend that schedule forward. Um, we have Thornton under, uh, phase one construction. And if you all have gone by that site, you can see that there is uh, 
temporary fencing up. They're starting to do a lot of site work and a lot of utility underground work. So um, that's ongoing and moving forward and we haven't had any major hiccups. So um, that that is moving along very nicely. And we have our main facility as well as our secondary facilities currently still in DSA under review. And we're anticipating getting those uh, comments back, hopefully, uh, they were due back, of course, this month, but we're probably going to get them back sometime in October. So um, we're looking at um, how to readjust the schedule based on uh, no students being on campus. And I'm due to report that to the board uh, by August 24th, because we're working with our construction teams and consultants to do the evaluation of what that looks like since we were informed that there are no students that will be on campus. So we can possibly accelerate or resequence some of the activities to kind of move things along. And that's appropriate for all sites that are currently under construction as well. Um, American High School is about 97% complete. So we are moving towards um, substantial completion and full turnover of that particular portion of the modernization, which is the HVAC work. Um, we've had several instances of break-ins, vandalisms, and just, you know, graffiti at that particular campus over the last month. And so we've been addressing it and kind of gotten things under control. Um, since um, Staff is back this week in terms of the custodians and the engineers uh, because we think because they're going to be on campus much more frequently, we will see less of that type of activity uh, district wide. So um, that's going on at American. Let's see, the next one is Horner Middle School. So um, the teachers and staff have moved into the new facility. Uh, they are currently in the process of getting their furniture assembled and sort of settling in and um, unpacking and getting situated in their new spaces. Uh, currently, there is still construction going on at Horner. The play fields and the parking areas are going to be under construction, and they're also in the process of finishing um, part one of the, um, what is it, the locker rooms. And so the secondary locker rooms are actually also the foundation work for that is being done and those will be installed and delivered uh, sometime in September or early October, but we have to wait on our DSA approval for those two particular structures. But we're looking at Horner, potentially uh, all the play fields and all of our secondary structures in the back should be finished substantially by um, the week before Thanksgiving. So we can ex expect to have a uh, full turnover of that site um, hopefully in January, if, if, you know, all of our I's are dotted and our T's are crossed. Um, the other school that we'd like to report out on is Centerville. Centerville um, is also another project that's in design development. We have started the, um, what is it, uh, site analysis and coordination with our industrial hy hygienists and our geologists on site. So they're doing some sampling for foundation work and uh, marking for utility layout, those kinds of things. And we are in DSA for approval for that as well. Uh, the last but not least is the, um, no, actually have two. So Hopkins is also another project that is um, under DSA review. We are working also with the California Geological Society to Get approval for a location of one of the structures that we had requested um, additional review from DSA had requested additional comments and review from CGS and so we're in the process to, process of taking care of that um, but that is moving along very nicely and uh, staff has reviewed the uh, design development documents and we did um, provide an update in our last um, I believe the last agenda had an update for Hopkins as well in terms of the design scope of work and um, some renderings for folks to take a look at. Uh, last but not least is Walters, actually Walters and Grimmer. So Grimmer is having their uh, final fencing installed. 
that is going along very well and that should be completed by the last week of August. And um, we have not had any hiccups, changes or change orders at this point. So knock on wood that that's moving along swiftly. And last but not least is Walters. And Walters is having the final, uh, I would say the last 20% of work being completed over the next two months. And that is the modification of the door thresholds to meet our ADA compliance requirements. And that work of course was delayed because we, we did have a fully occupied campus and we did not want to interrupt um, you know, student activities during the school year. So that work was done during the summer. And COIL is the last uh, project. They have completed uh, their Prop 39 lighting retrofit and um, oh, I'm sorry, I also forgot the Rick's Glankler site is uh, in the process of being submitted to DSA for review. And we're hoping to get those comments back sometime in November for a potential modernization construction start date for sometime next spring. So that's my update and I hope I stayed on time. Yes, definitely. And do you have any um, other color on the facilities equity analysis? I know that came up during the last meeting. Has you know, I, I had discussed that with um, our m and folks today and a couple questions came back. And so I wanted to ask you guys, have you all um, defined what your equity, um, equity objectives are? Because there were three or four different interpretations of what that was. And rather than me try and define it for them, I wanted you guys to basically tell me what you guys are looking for as it relates to that so that I can accurately answer it and not kind of go off on a tangent that's wrong. If I recall correctly, and I'll defer to some of the other committee members, I believe it was either you or another member uh, of district staff that had mentioned um, that analysis. And we then, you know, uh, shared our interest in potentially um, assisting on that project. We would definitely want to be involved. So really, you know, we're curious as to, A, who's leading that project, and B, can it be brought to us at regular intervals so that we can either take a very direct role in it um, or alternatively hear reports as it goes along. Okay. So I would just push back and say, what is it? Um, we would like to know um, because we, we want to know if we want to get involved. Okay. Um, so from my perspective and what I have been working with my staff on is that we are looking at what are the district standards and looking at the standardization of sort of everything that each school should have as a basic item, you know, whether it's, um, you know, bathrooms, lighting, um, emergency phones, working HVAC, um, adequate play space or play fields, um, egress in and out of facilities, you know, making sure we're fire life safety compliant. And that's sort of our baseline that I know my office has been working from. And I know from m and perspective, when I talked to them earlier, um, they're looking at sort of a different set of things of, hey, here's our deferred maintenance item list and how can we equitably attack it versus, you know, only looking at certain things at certain campuses. And so that's why I was going to ask you guys, um, because we're, we're kind of looking at a lot of different things, but I want to look at how we establish the baseline of the district standards of what is required at a facility to function at a, um, a basic level and then build from there. Because you know, of course, the elementary school is going to be different than middle school and middle school is different from high school. And depending on programming, um, you're going to have a whole different set of stuff that's going to be supporting that program based on the school that you're at. So that's, that's kind of something to look at too, but that's further down the road. Okay, got it. Um, if no committee member has any recollection about the specific reference, we may want to table it. Oh, go ahead, Brian. And then Trustee uh, Jones. 
Oh, yeah, so I think, um, uh, well, I guess the, 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 I guess two points. So the one angle I was thinking is also there, there is a uh, perception that there's not equity and, and there could be reality too, right? So I think that there was generally a community concern uh, that especially came up. And I do remember even do the previous superintendent, Dr. Wallace, in one of her, uh, in one of her meetings talking about kicking off a, a facilities equity analysis as well. So I think, at least from my recollection, I. I think that's part of the uh, the interest, and in, in perhaps where a body like this would be most helpful is in is in in, in helping uh, figure out how to how to analyze and and, and share with the community, you know, what is the true nature of of our you know how equitable or un unequitable our facilities, I think is um, uh, certainly a huge concern pre-COVID. I'll put it that way, mm -hmm. and it's still now, I'm sure, but. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that clarification. Uh, Trustee Jones. You know, and I think part of what the board thinks about in terms of equity with facilities are some of the concerns that parents raise that uh, Brian mentioned is, you know, we hear a lot about discrepancies with MURs. And we do know that we have schools that at one point opted to upgrade an MUR with a, a long ago bond. Um, and, and can you just find for me what does MUR stand for? I'm sorry, multi-use room. Oh, okay. So, so we know that you know there has, have been some schools that have added capacity to their school sites with say portables, but their MUR is say they have a student population of 800, but their MUR can only accommodate you know say 300 students. Okay. Um, I, you know, and maybe there are some um, issues with should we try to strive for having a performance space at each of the secondary schools, things like that. So I think um, when I think about equity and then when I think what I hear from parents is, you know, if there's a performance space at one school, why don't we have a performance space? If there is an adequate MUR at one site, why isn't there adequate MUR space here? If there's covered lunch space at one site, why isn't there covered lunch space at another? So I think those are the kinds of things that parents are thinking about. Yeah, and going off of those two points, um, I think it is something that we would want to look at regardless. But now I do recall that it was the the prior superintendent's like project. Um, so to the extent you know, Superintendent Kamek is not taking that up. Um, to, uh, whatever work you know, M and O and your team is doing, uh, we would definitely appreciate you know reports of findings. Um, and then I'll pass it back to Brian and your hand raised. Yes, just because I can't resist adding everybody's favorite equity topic, restrooms, is it also something that uh, that continues to come up. So that's all. Okay. And we have a minute and 15 seconds left. Could, um, do you have any updates on the staffing at the stadium and then on the progress on responding to the prior public speaker's uh, landscaping project? Uh, for the so I shared with you our uh, response from MNO. So we are going to be assisting our Eagle Scout on his project. So MNO is going to be working directly with him to complete that over uh, the rest of the summer or into the early fall. I believe that um, they had a conversation again today and more details were uh, shared as to how that's going to be accomplished. But um, that was something that we did get approval for and is working through the system to actually get that uh, kicked off the ground and, and moving. The second item, um, staffing at the stadium, it is my understanding that there is still not going to be uh, full-time staffing there. And currently, uh, my understanding is the only thing that is going to go on is just the regular maintenance and the um, M&O staff are, and the ground staff are gonna be maintaining that facility at this point. I understand they're still in conversation with uh, the unions about different particular staffing, but I don't have any um, details on the stadium staff per se, other than uh, what they've been given um, to us over the last week. Okay, thank you. Um, so that exhausts our time for this item, and we can go ahead and move uh, to the to the meat of our meeting, um, and that's the portable classroom threshold that we discussed at the end of the last meeting. 
Um, so I would like us to refer to exhibit B. I'd like to first start off by thanking all of these subcommittee members. Um, so that's Liz, Henry, and Brian who worked on um, this question in between the meetings to further refine um, and kind of define the scope. Um, and um, specifically, I'd like to thank Brian for his work on um, crunching the numbers in the capacity report, which, and I'll hand that off to him in a few minutes. But if you go to the exhibit B of our agenda, um, I'd like us. I'd like us to. We can skip past, unless Kelly, you have any um, responses as to that twenty percent number. Were you able to? Uh, find out anything. Otherwise, we'll skip to item number two on the prior. No, I'm I'm still waiting on some responses on that. So um, let's go ahead and move forward. Okay. And the reason we were looking at this item in the as uh, the facilities. Let me see. What is it called? SFNA. I'm trying to find it now. At the facility uh, school facilities need analysis. I believe is what yeah. The, that's right. Um, there was a discussion that at least 20% of teaching stations within the school district have to be relocatable classrooms um, in order to qualify for a certain tier of developer fees. Mm -hmm. That really informed our thinking at the outset. But once we started troubleshooting it or, or testing that number against the numbers we were finding in the capacity report, mm -hmm. we were we needed further definition of what a relocatable classroom is under that analysis. And so without that, we kind of have to discard that floor. Mm -hmm. um, if this is true, then yes, we should not pick a number lower than 20% if it can potentially um, you know, provide us funding. But if it's defined in a different way or you know, doesn't match our analysis, then that is not the floor that we should be looking at. So that was the first point that we looked at. Could I add to that just briefly, the, that, that report is key to setting developer fees um, and, and obviously, Kelly or anybody who's more familiar, but I just want to make sure everybody on the committee had context for why that report is so important. Okay. Um, to did you want me to try and answer that first question of the difference between the portable versus no? What was the question? Modular well, versus portable. Yeah, or, right, okay. right, and we'll get to that um, in uh, item number six uh, for okay. questions for the committee to consider. But really, we, we would like to know, um, to, to kind of make any kind of final recommendation, where we're coming up with that 28% figure. Um, and so that could come to us in the next meeting. Uh, because if that's matching the numbers that we have for the district, then again, we'll look at that 20% as our floor. But as of right now, we're just going to disregard it until we get further color on that. Well, I did have an opportunity to talk to um, John Cheswick, Kevin Arthur, and I actually talked to Dr. Morris about this um, when he was here last week. Um, this district analyzes, and there, there are about four different methods by which uh, calculations are done for portable classrooms versus permanent classrooms versus um, instructional space versus support space versus um, I think we had a category of um, interdisciplinary or multi-use space. So because the way our capacity report is laid out, those particular spaces are not always clearly identified. And so a lot of times when the camp, well, I say the campuses, the school sites return their capacity information to us. Um, it's not always clear. They may say, oh, we have 27 classrooms, but of the 27, there may be five classrooms that are non-instructional space. Even though technically they're a classroom, they may have been converted to a counseling room or a learning resource area or a support room for students that have special needs or something like that. So I've asked each one of them to come back to us and say, hey, you know, really identify for me what your usage is for these spaces that you've identified. If it's truly vacant, call it vacant. If it's truly a classroom, only call it a classroom. But if, if you've taken classroom space and turned it into a teacher workroom or a teacher lunchroom or a 
uh, resource room for supplemental library support services. We need to know that. And a lot of times we don't really know what those spaces are unless we physically go to the site and actually open the door and look, oh, okay, this is what this is. Or if they've expanded the front office area, a lot of times, and this is something that we've been discussing in our task force for um, the COVID-19 response is that um, the nurse's office in many cases, if you have a small campus, they will take a room that's not being utilized and make that your sick room or your secondary space to support admin support services. So it's kind of changing our whole definition of how spaces are used. And so I'm working now to figure out how to clearly define what that looks like. The other thing that's changed since you all did get the PEC capacity report, um, we have terminated six leases on portables that we were leasing and we're in the process of removing them from uh, sites. So for instance, Horner had two portables that were where their leases had expired, but they also turned out to be classrooms that had been uh, replaced by the new facility. So looking at future programming, we sat down with the principal and said, hey, are you still gonna use this? She says, no, I don't need them. I've covered all these things in these other areas. So we went ahead and terminated those lease agreements and those portables have since been removed. Thornton is another site where we have a large number of portables those are gonna change based on the footprint and use of the new facility that's going up. So understanding there is um, a shift in the count of portables that will be there. We're still working with Stan to figure out before we remove them, do you still have sufficient space or are those spaces gonna be used as, uh, we call it interim housing while your uh, new facilities or your modernized spaces are being worked on, are those still gonna be there and for how long? And if they're not gonna be used post-modernization, we can then remove them as well. So we're in the process of doing that. And so I don't have a definitive answer for you guys based on the capacity report that I shared with you because it has changed since we, we first prepared that for you all. Sure, and I, I think this is a good uh, first pass for the committee to really orient itself around the different set of facts um, about this question before we, you know, finalize any kind of recommendation to the board and, and to really orient ourselves. The, the final recommendation that the sub subcommittee came up with um, is at the end of Exhibit B, um, and then I'll tie it into Kelly's comments and, you know, the sources that we looked at. Essentially, we want to look at you know, every school site across the district, and to the extent a school site has a large percentage of portable classrooms, um, temporary, portable, or relocatable, we still need to finalize that definition. Um, and this would be post the middle school conversion. Mm -hmm. We don't want to focus on prior to the middle school conversion because that's just going to change um, facilities needs, both at the elementary and middle school level. So if a school site has a, more than a certain percentage um, then we would recommend that the board um, and district staff should look at either building permanent classrooms at that site or exploring boundary changes at that site or determining some other solution to uh, fix that imbalance. And the reason we're looking at this question was A, at the request of uh, a board member, but think of a, you know, think of a, a school site where half of its um, uh, classrooms are portable. Um, and that leads to, I mean, A, that's, gonna, uh, that's part of a discussion of, you know, what is the difference between teaching in a portable classroom versus not? Um, what um, challenges does it bring? And so I'll talk about that in a minute. The sources that we um, looked at were, so let me just go over the, this in general before we then delve into specifics. So we looked at the, the, um, the needs analysis to figure out if there was a floor. Again, we don't know that there is until we figure out that definition. We looked at our prior discussion, if you recall, we discussed this in, I believe, January of 2019. Um, and so we'll delve into that in, in a bit. 
Um, we looked at the costs of having temporary classrooms. We wanted to know if that was a factor in our analysis. We delved into the capacity report that Kelly had provided to us earlier this year, um, I believe during the summer. And we plugged all those numbers in to try to identify um, sites that maybe had a large percentage of temporary classrooms. And then we built a set of questions that we felt we needed answers to before we could, as a subcommittee or committee, recommend a, a final number or a threshold where then the board doesn't have to do anything about it, but has to then look at the question for you know, our recommendation if they take that up, right? So if they end up adopting a policy after we go through you know, after we go above, let's say, just throwing a wild number out there, 80% temporary classrooms, right? No site has that. We're going to have to look at it. How do we solve this problem? So those are the various um, items that we looked at or sources that we looked at. So I want to, uh, so right now, you know, Kelly was kind of giving us more information on what needs, what work needs to further go into the capacity report in order for that to be finalized. All right, so there have been some updates. And then we have some feedback that we've provided her based on our analysis. And so that's item number four. I wanna take us now to item number two on exhibit B. Um, again, we're skipping past item number one because of the lack of definition. So the prior discussion on portables um, is at the time when we discussed this, again, this is January 5th, 2019. There were 72 temporary portable buildings in the district, um, but uh, temporary modular buildings were factored in together in percentages in contrast to permanent buildings. So Briar, for example, had nine modular buildings. And if you recall, we had an extensive discussion, what's the difference between a modular building and a uh, portable building? Um, and then we had also asked Henry, who's our FUTTO rep, to uh, ask teachers as to the differences between portable classrooms and other types of classrooms. So if we, I'd like to give the committee a few, you know, a minute to review the last page on the teacher feedback regarding the use of portables. I don't believe any much has changed since that time. So I'd just like to um, go silent and give everybody some time to read um, the pros and cons. Antonio, I have a question. When you guys did the study, did they identify if these were um, permanent uh, portables that were owned or permanent uh, or, or facilities that were still under lease? No, that was a question that we would also want an answer to. Um, okay. uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute um, okay. or hand it over to Brian why we wanted that answer. Okay. So I'll assume that you know, people had a chance to review the list of, um, you know, kind of the pros and cons of teaching in temporary classrooms. Um, and so moving forward, um, we then looked at the classroom, uh, the, you know, how much it costs to have a temporary classroom. Now this is, uh, in response to Kelly's question, this is um, the leasing reports. Uh, these are the matters that go before the board and they help us identify, if you go ahead and click on like 2019, Let's see. How is that it? So, uh, you know, the cost, like an annual lease, is like seven to eight thousand dollars, plus a monthly cost of six hundred and fifty dollars. You'll see, and this is the key point for us. Um, we were wondering, is the removal very expensive? In which case, we will want to keep those portables there, maybe even though we don't have a use for them. But it looks like it's half the annual cost. So to the extent we don't feel we need a portable classroom, nor will we, you know, for the near future, then it is probably in the interest of the district to remove the classroom. Uh, 
So that's the first link, um, the modular leases, all funds with COIL link. Um, and then the fourth item was the uh, very extensive capacity report. If you wanna go ahead and click through that, you'll notice that it's broken down by school site and it's a pretty large file. So still waiting for it to load. Um, in it, there are a few notes um, for each of the school sites that mention, you know, how many of them are temporary classrooms. Um, and, and so this is where I'll hand it off to, or maybe we could focus on, you know, an example first before we go. I mean, I'd love to share my screen and I'll share the report. Um, Let me know if you can't. Oh, oh, I can just, oh, I, I didn't know if I had the power or not. And then, uh, and I, I'll share my screen to get, bring the report up. Um, I see Liz has her hand raised though, so. You should be able to, Brian. All right, go ahead, Liz. Yes, um, I was just wanting to add that um, on the number two item, uh, in previous discussion, we also had discussed in December of 2018, um, and uh, Sh John Swastik, he uh, gave us a list of uh, pros and cons and considerations. They're not exactly reflected in the minutes. It was kind of an attachment, but um, I think they're, that uh, there, there's some good good uh, information there. So since this item will likely come back to us for our next meeting, that's another source that we'll want to add. Okay. And then go ahead, Brian. So he's showing us Arden one from the capacity report, and I'll hand it off to him. Thank you. So, um, um, and so I think first off, I want to thank Kelly and staff for this report. This is a such great information, even even that as um, uh, as, as she noted that they're they're working to update it and make it even more accurate. Uh, this is such powerful information that we can use to do lots of different analysis. Um, and um, and if you haven't looked at it, it, it takes it took me some time uh, working with it to kind of to understand it and uh, and work with the data. But what um, uh, what we have here is we have all, all the classrooms and, and how they're loaded, how they're currently used. Uh, we have the other instructional spaces, administrative spaces in there. I think I was trying to find a good example from our, uh, I need to go down to Ol Olivera. Actually, I'll do this. And so, uh, all right, that didn't work as well as I had hoped. Let's find a, uh, uh, Hirsch is a, actually, this, this, here's a bunch of, this is Leach. Leach is a good example. So um, a, as we were looking at um, the number of temporary leased portables um, across, we took a look at um, all, the, all the schools where the remark was temp. And, um, and I've summarized that uh, here. And I'm going to do this briefly so we can get to Q and A and find out where people want more information or less. Um, uh, as the subcommittee will tell you, I can give you a lot of information. Um, but the uh, the this is a summary of um, um, and, and again, there's some review we want to do with staff around to make sure we're looking at the right numbers in the right way. Um, but what? Um, I, I focused on was looking at all of the classrooms and kindergartens, anything that was marked a CR or a K to give us uh, an, into total, and that's very close to the net classroom count for every school. Um, and then we added up all the temporaries with these, which we believe are the temporary leases, and this where we need in further in, in the questions part of this, we, we need to clarify the, 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 that scope as well. But if you look at the temporary lease, you can see uh, highlighted in yellow, the um, uh, basically the, the ones that were above uh, 10%. Let's see if I'm, uh, which was Leach, Oliveira, American, Irvington, and Horner. Oh, oops, sorry, Thor Thornton as well. And so those were the six sites uh, that we thought merited further discussion and potentially would might even trigger 
you know, assuming we move forward with the recommendation that um, Antonio shared uh, might trigger a deeper review, like do we have too many least temporary portables on those sites or not? Um, Just a very basic question, Brian. What is that, for example, for American, what does that 22% represent? So 22% is, uh, there are, thank you, there are 15 temporary leased portables on American. And, oh, I forgot. Uh, high schools are different. CRs and Ks don't add up. They're the same way. Um, I apologize. Uh, I think that for high schools. I would go uh, back. What does that 34% in Oliveira represent, Brian? Thank you. So it's 12 divided by 35. Is, uh, Antonio was trying to give me a softball here. Um, but basically, um, there are 12 temporary leased classrooms uh, out of the 35 total. So 34% of the classrooms on that site are uh, temporary leased. Okay, great. Um, and so that, that the, the highlighted items match, you know, kind of the classrooms that we identified in Exhibit B that we would definitely want to take a look at. Obviously, there's going to be a, um, either extensive or minor work on the capacity report to update it. But if you know efforts could be focused on these six sites, that would be greatly appreciated. I know that Brian mentioned temporary. Sorry, I lost my participants tab. Liz, do you have a, a comment? Go ahead. Yes, I, I wanted to add, um, at American, they have portable uh, bathroom facilities. So um, I'm not sure if that has its own uh, kind of acronym or designation, um, but certainly that would factor into their percentages, I believe. Right, and that's what I was talking about earlier, how we have to go back through and identify clearly where their classrooms versus bathrooms or secondary support spaces, because that also affects how we, when we do our reporting for funding, what comes back to us, so. Thanks for that clarification. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so one of the first things we did, um, so I, I go back to the point about Brian mentioning these are temporary leased. Um, the capacity report, I would imagine, would identify all temporary classrooms, whether they're leased or owned, right? Correct. That could be the Correct. intent. But the numbers didn't seem to match up for us. So that's why we would certainly um, you know, warrant another set of eyes on it. So when we compared like the 2019 2020 least temporary classrooms item that's um, in the agenda that's it's this one here a yeah exactly you'll see like Glenmore has two temporary classrooms that we're leasing and then when you go back to Brian's spreadsheet um, we don't see any in the uh, capacity report well and that's probably because the district is probably in an arrangement where it's lease option to buy or we're purchasing it versus it being a truly temporary facility that will be removed. So that's what I also need to clarify because we have several agreements where we initially started out in a lease with, hey, we're only going to have it for two years. We'll fast forward 10 years, we're still in a lease arrangement or either it's converted to a purchase agreement and so that's what I needed to get clarification on because that was confusing for me as well when I started to look at it to say, well, yes, it's a portable, but we're owning it. And when the district looks at real property, even though it may be a portable classroom, if it's a permanent structure, they don't identify it as a portable. It turns into a permanent structure that's then calculated differently. So it's a lot of sort of moving parts in this that need to be sort of defined a little bit better to to get clarity on these. But um, this right, is so really I feel like helpful. there's two issues identified there, right? So regardless of whether it would be leased or purchased after you know um, the lease to buy, it should be identified as a temporary classroom um, if it's supportable. Or alternatively, there might be this issue of um, maybe principals are identifying. Um, modulars, permanent modulars differently than mm -hmm. a, uh, a portable. That's part of their clarification that I'm looking for. Because right, right, right. I looked at the same information and said, hey, wait a minute, this isn't quite right based on the information we have in our office of what our lease agreements are versus what they're reporting. So 
we're we're fine tuning and tightening that up as well. Got it. And then let me skip to Judy first. I just want to say from a principal's perspective, we've never been told how to categorize them. I've never had an explanation. So that might be something that we need to do to reach out to principals to let them us all know how important it is. No, I I I thank you because I I I didn't know either. So this is good to know. And I, I want to build on Judy's comment. I think there's such um, power power in this data. And uh, Brian, if I may pass to Liz and then I'll go to you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Liz. So um, I think you know when we talked about our floor as being relocatable. I think if there's a portable that is either leased or even leased with an option to buy, um, you know, it's still a relocatable uh, classroom. Now, uh, modulars, I'm not sure how they factor into that. Um, maybe those are relocatable also. Um, I mean, Kelly, could you let us know how that, how a modular might be considered a relocatable? Well, um, how can I say this without it sounding contradictory? So when I refer to a portable, I refer to the 15 by 40s that sit on a two foot um, structure, you know, foundation that you can, it's put in temporarily for up to five years or 10 years, whatever the term is. And um, it's anchored in a particular way that allows us to remove it quickly. A modular building is one that is a prefabricated structure that can be assembled quickly and may have a similar foundation as a temporary portable, but is considered permanent in the designation or use of it. So it's a different method of construction versus a actual type of unit. Right. And so I'm not, and I don't want to speak for those that came before me because I don't know how they were designating it in this district because I'm finding you guys designated things a little bit district different than the other districts that I worked in. So I don't want to speak and say that that's you know, wrong, but that is what I need to understand and figure out how those things have been identified and designated. And then when we talk about um, you know, stick built or brick and mortar, that's a building that's built with traditional methods of construction where you, know, you dig from the ground up and build and nothing is um, prefabricated at another site and brought to the job site and then you know, tilted up or installed. So that's how I have defined it, but um, that may not be what we've been doing historically here, so. Okay, okay. thank you. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, yes, uh, um, I wanted to build on Judy's comment. I think this data is so powerful that um, uh, sharing it with the principals and helping them visualize and see how it can be used, I think will help Help us get the uh, help, help us make the data more accurate too, and I would I would love to help any way I can offline uh, to make that successful. Um, might, I, might I share too that one of the um, things that I discussed with uh, Dr. Morris last week was you know I wanted to understand um, sort of the intention and the use of these temporary facilities as Fremont you know was doing in the past. And he explained to me that um, I guess over the course of several cycles, you guys have had, you know, ebbs and flows of growth. And of course, portables are used to accommodate districts for their explosion of growth and having an immediate need to put students in housing. What happened and how it was explained to me is that, you know, all of our existing facilities are extremely old. They were designed to accommodate a much smaller load of student body than what we are currently housing our students at. And so because the growth accelerated past the pace by which we were actually to fund new construction for that growth. So you're gonna have an imbalance in the amount of temporary structures you have 
versus what you have in brick and mortar facilities or your permanent facilities, because we haven't created that equilibrium to say, okay, we, we hadn't passed a bond in quite a long time. And because the needs of the bond in terms of looking at the facilities exceeded the capacity of what we were able to buy with what we have in hand, we're kind of where we are with the temporary and the new based on that historical cycles that have occurred within Fremont. And so long story short, we, we don't have the capacity of our permanent structures to accommodate the growth in student body that we have. So that's why we have all these portables to basically put a Band-Aid on what we need until we're able to build new to take those portables away. So just to, um, to finish my comment um, and maybe to, to, to pivot to the question, right? Because I think the question is, well, but the first question just to, to anchor everybody on is, why is this important, right? The main, the, the primary reason I think we wanted to talk about this is because some of these temporary spaces are not uh, necessarily uh, as ideal for instruction as our permanent spaces, right? And we wanted to make sure it's re really about having the best instructional spaces for our students and and uh, and teachers, and um, uh, and 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 so I think I think defining what a portable is, what a temporary is, what a module is, I think. Um, uh, I think it's absolutely what uh, Kelly and staff, what you should, what you guys sh should do. And I think, from my perspective, I think there's so much confusion on that definition that I think uh, anything you put uh, to paper that's specific and clear uh, will help everybody. Uh, okay. Forget past practice, if you ask me. I mean, you might have to correct data for past practice, but as far as I'm concerned, this has been a confusing topic for goodness for me at least ten years. I've been confused and. Um, uh, because we 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 talk, we're talking leased temporaries, permanent temporaries, modulars, and 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 are modulars bad for instruction? Well, then why are we why are we doing them if they're bad for instruction? So I think there's a lot of perception out there too that needs to be uh, um, uh, teased apart. To the, um, and then and then I just uh, on the on the table if you if you add up um, all the temporary leased portables compared to the number of classrooms in the district it's like three or four percent so it's not you know i i, I uh it's I'm, not excessive it's not it doesn't seem excessive to me uh and i will um i'll pause there and want to hear from the rest of the committee now let's go ahead liz you're on mute liz you're on mute there we go. Um, so Kelly, as you were saying um, that a lot of our schools are pretty old and they were built with lower capacities in mind. We had to add all these temporaries and modulars um, in order to accommodate our growth. Um, well, another thing that came up as we were looking at classrooms um, was the space of a classroom. Mm -hmm. um, there are certainly some schools that, I don't know, they must have had a, a, a different teacher to student ratio. They were designed for that and they look particularly small. And, and I think too that um, over time, um, there are definitely multi-use rooms that have been eaten up and, mm -hmm. and uh, they've built classrooms inside of them or they've done other instructional spaces support spaces, et cetera, that even made those MURs even smaller. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, so certainly uh, portables, when they're 15 by 40, I, I would imagine that's sufficient space. Um, but uh, some of our permanent classrooms are kind of lacking in space. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we're focusing on the portables right now, but but I think that uh, when we want to bring uh, an, an improved facility uh, to um, our elementary schools in particular, we kind of need to look also at those classroom mm -hmm. spaces. Mm -hmm. I agree. All right, so I, um, 
Let me see. Let me make sure we are. Okay, so we've identified the school sites, but um, Brian, if you could quickly share that that um, your screen one more time so that we can look at that 3% figure before we then delve in further. So if you recall, the, the scope of the question is specifically about, um, you know, is there dispar are there disparities within the school districts at specific sites? Did we lose Brian? Oh, no. I'm, I'm here. I'm... I, apparently I'm Zoom challenged. I can't remember. I lost the share button. Oh, there it is. Can you just go to the bottom? So we're seeing a total of like 66 which again, we need to square up. Let's say there's a hundred, for example, that still only puts us at around 8%, mm -hmm. 8% at the most. But at 66 right now, uh, it's only 5% of classrooms within the district are um, temporary, right? So, but then going back to the scope of the question, it's we're focused on school sites. So now, if you let me share my screen, or maybe I can just do it anyways. <laughs> so, the subcommittee looked at, for example, um, Oliveira. Can everybody see screen? Now, unfortunately, I can't see you all. Okay. And it was helpful um, to take a look at these are what we believe we identified as the portable classrooms. Mm -hmm. So in the capacity report, I believe we counted 12. Here's four plus three, seven, plus another three, 10, um, 11, 12. Now, I'm not as familiar with Oliveira, um, literally just got this satellite view. It seems like the rest of the school is really over here. I believe they're multi-use room. If anybody is more familiar, please go ahead and, and jump in. I can't see the participants tab because I'm sharing screen. So you just unmute. Yeah, the multi-use room, if you see where the eating space is, um, I guess to the north, uh, that's the multi-use room. And then the office space then is adjoining uh, no, no, uh, that's no. other, uh, to the front where the parking lot is, that's the office space right okay. here. Mm -hmm. Got it. All right. I can't locate, for example, from a satellite view where the restrooms are, uh, but they're, they're located actually here. kind of in the middle, um, okay. of the long extension, um, that, no, uh, the longer one. Yes. Uh-huh. They have some there, and I'm not familiar with the other building that makes the L, but. Got it. And so you'll see the, the point about, you know, to the extent you're teaching in a portable classroom, in order to even use your break to go to the, to the facilities, it, it'll be difficult to do so. Um, and maybe that'll help resonate. But again, you know, I, I tend to be more visual. Um, so this really helped illustrate, you know, the numbers. Okay, so then let us, so these are the questions that I think we need to consider. Now I believe I can see participants. Um, so what does a relocatable classroom look like? Um, I really appreciate Kelly kind of describing um, that shape, you know, the, was it 15 by 40? Mm -hmm. So yeah. these are very long classrooms, right? And I know that I've heard teachers talk about, you know, just even setting up their classroom. Um, it's difficult to teach in that kind of setting. It's a very wide classroom, uh, or very, sorry, very long, depending on which way you look at it. Um, do you know the, the dimensions of a modular? Do they also take that same shape, uh, Kelly? You know, you have um, standard sizes that uh, DSA provides as, hey, this is the standard, but um, sometimes they're a little bit wider, sometimes they're a little bit shorter based on what the specifications that the district requires of it. But that's just like the standard off the rack, let me pull it from my yard and dro drop it on your site. But like for instance, in Horner, the uh, PE locker rooms are, are 36 by 40. So that's much larger than the 15 by 40. So it's kind of like a double wide and double, you know, double width, double height or length. And so, um, and that was a special, you know, a special request that we made. So um, it all depends on what the need is and what is specified, but 
Um, the 15 by 40 or the 20 by 40 is roughly the standard in the industry that uh, people draw from and that's priced out that you can kind of pull off the rack and, and purchase. For portables or for permanent modulars? Or for both? Uh, either or. It's, it's oh, okay. you know, you, you can do one or the other and you can, um, and the price will differ based on the type of construction that you choose. And to com contrast, like a regular classroom, do you know the dimensions? Um, Capacity well, report most classrooms are uh, 960 square feet, and it doesn't matter how the configuration, whether it's a square or rectangle, circle, or you know, obtuse, you know, geometric shape, as long as it meets 960 square feet of teachable space, it's considered a classroom. And so there's no dimension per se, um, but you have to have, um, you know, means of egress, you have to have so much natural light, you have to have, um, you know, communications, water supply, depending upon the grade level and the use of the room. And then there's a minimum square footage area per student that's required and a square footage area required for the instructor. And so that's what, comp you know, composes that 960 uh, square feet for uh, a standard classroom. So to say that all of them are the same, they're not, but they do have to meet that minimum requirement of the square footage footprint of space allocated for uh, the teacher and the students functioning in the space. Okay, got it. Um, so the, the further questions, uh, go ahead, Brian. Brian, you're on mute. Uh, go ahead and finish the questions. I have a, a suggestion for moving forward, but I'll, I'll wait till after the questions. Okay, got it. Um, so I think we agree on what a relocatable, or sorry, what a portable classroom is, but we wanna know what a relocatable classroom is, right? Does that include permanent modulars? Um, again, how do we get to that 28%? Um, what is the definition of a portable or relocatable classroom? Are they synonyms? Um, or does the latter, um, uh, the relocatable, include modulars? Um, what is the difference between a modular and a portable, right? Mm -hmm. Just, for example, the fact that one is prefabricated, but they have similar foundations. It seems like they have similar shapes. Um, and then a, a key point is what's the number of owned um, versus lease portables? Uh, I think it's, it's important for us for costs but also leased, we can return back to the lessor. Whereas owned, you know, we have, maybe we can move it to another site, but we have less options. Um, what's the configuration for portable? Um, I think Kelly answered that for the most part, but we'd love to see it in writing for the next meeting. Or common agreement on the quality of building slash education for portable classrooms, right? If there's disagreement among the committee, as to whether or not like the quality of education is different. Let's just go with different um, in a classroom, then that's something we will want to discuss uh, further. And then uh, go ahead, Brian. Very sorry, that was a cough, sorry. No, no, I'm done with the questions. You said you wanted to talk after the questions. Oh, okay, yes. So building on the last question, you just they, it seems to me that we should, set what our standard is for a permanent modular with instruct and with instruction in mind, right? So if if these narrow wide classrooms are, are, are relatively universally agreed that that they're not the right instructions, then why would we build any of those permanent modulars in Fremont Unified, right? So it seems like uh, that should go into the, the heart of what our standards for permanent modulars are and to the degree we can for temporaries as well. I could, I could imagine, to, um, yeah, yeah. We should, it feels like that's where we should perhaps one area we can attack this by these are the these are the standards and anything that deviates from the standards you know you, you know, needs approval from the board or something if you know or because it's a special case because there's only so much space on the site but but 99.9 percent .9 of what we build should be what we think is instructionally sound so i would like to remind us though um, and this is for broader discussion and so i'll open it up to the group but um, gushing that the that the committee had a lot of them focus around maintenance issues. So to the extent, for example, portables just um, like the 
that maintenance, um, they need it more often um, or they t deteriorate at a faster rate than a permanent modular. Um, many of the complaints on the pro and cons list uh, focused around that. So not just um, quality of education, but quality of the building as well. And then lastly, if I could return us back to your spreadsheet, if you don't mind, Brian. So despite the fact that, you know, we still want to settle somewhat on numbers, I think that the numbers that we do have kind of give us, you know, um, again, a focus. So we'll make sure we work with district staff to uh, focus on those six um, sites specifically. But I want to, again, our attention to that, because to a certain degree, we can start thinking about a potential recommendation and start discussing it. So for, for instance, I'll use Horner as an example. So we pulled two portables from Horner two weeks ago. So that reduces that number from eight down to six. We're adding two permanent structures, which will then push it back up to eight, but we're also now taking away three at the end of October because their leases are out and they're no longer used based on programming. So now that drops you back down to five. So that's gonna change that percentage at that particular site completely based on those few activities over the next you know, 60, 90, 120 days. So um, that's why I say for me, I have to spend a little more time on this to give you guys um, as accurate information because it is moving right now based on the activities that we have going on, so. Right, absolutely, and and I and I mean more not because we're going to finalize the recommendation by the end of this. I mean, I think we're down to thirty seconds, right? Unless we extend the time on this, not because we're going to finalize that recommendation, but again, like the the subcommittee's recommendation is to focus on post middle school conversion, so that there's less moving pieces, mm -hmm. and then to pick a specific threshold. We originally started our our analysis with twenty percent, then realized doesn't need to necessarily be 20% if we're only focused on portables and not portables plus permanent modulars. But that's a question for the committee. Should we also include permanent modulars in this analysis? Um, and so then once we have final numbers, um, you know, what does a good percentage look like? So mm -hmm. I think that pretty much wraps up this item unless we'd like to extend it by some amount of time. Um, I, I would, I don't know. If I would like to extend my five minutes for the purpose of, I would love to hear from other committee members. The uh, subcommittee has been in the weeds of this. Um, and I think getting feedback from the rest of the committee uh, would, be, would be supremely helpful. So is there a second? I will second. Great. Um, so all in favor, please raise your hand. All right, please lower your hand. All opposed. All right, the ayes have it. If anybody has comments, now would be a great time. If not, then then we won't need the five minutes. <laughs> or more specifically, questions. Uh, oh, go ahead, Judy. <laughs> I have a comment because until tonight, because I missed the July meeting, I considered my um, three buildings as portables, but now I'm understanding that they're modulars. And I just want to put out there that they do have the same concerns as a portable they're literally falling apart and they've been there for at least 15 years because I've been there 11 and they've been there the entire time. That's, so. and, 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 that, and Judy, that's part of what I want to kind of look at as well is to look at the age of a lot of these structures because, you know, they're not designed to be in use for that long. And, you know, um, there's, I mean, it, we could pull the covers back and there's a lot of issues contributing to this. 
but it really boils down to um, funding capacity, capability, and staffing resources to maintain. Mm -hmm. And until we agree to support deferred maintenance in a manner that's appropriate for the size and use of the facilities that we have, we're going to continue to see the type of deterioration and wear and tear that you're talking about in those temporary facilities because it's just not being maintained because the resources have not been committed to do that. So, and then this is just not your district. It's no. everywhere. That yeah, that I just happens. I just wanted to bring that up as a just a fact of uh, everyday life. Yeah. So before I move to Henry, then um, I would echo Brian's point, like to the extent, you know, pictures of a permanent and a portable can be shared with staff members um, with direction of, hey, I know you turned in your capacity reports, but if you could revisit that based on, you know, these um, descriptions, that would be yeah. super helpful because we really need to separate out permanent modulars and temporaries. Um, and then, yeah, we absolutely need the age data. That was something that we had discussed at the subcommittee level. Um, should it not just be based on a percentage, but also age? Um, Henry. Uh, yes. So the thing is, um, like what you all mentioned, but uh, we're going to try to do a survey again with our teachers soon. Of course, of course, all the teachers right now just concentrating on the distance learning and the start of the school year. But in a month or so, we can send um, we can send a survey. But I would like to know what kind of questions you would like me to ask our teachers. Uh, because like the last survey, like the one that we looked at, um, we we were very broad about what's portable, what's what's modular, what's what's permanent. Um, mm -hmm. But it would be nice if we can, um, like what kind of questions we can ask. And definitely the age of, like what Kelly was saying, the age of the portable is going to be very important because like the modular, even though it looks more like an actual classroom, but there's some really old ones and some teachers would rather teach in a portable than teaching in those modular. Mm -hmm. So we need to, some, um, yeah, let, if you guys can help me out and see what kind of questions I should ask our teachers. I never taught a portable before, so I've always been in a classroom, so I don't have that. So but I definitely will need that feedback from my teachers. Is and it possible for you guys to share with me the last survey and I could possibly contribute to help you guys on that? Um, okay, what we would ask is when you send out um, any message to principals where you describe um, those, we could use that to then feed um, the survey to teachers. Okay. But help clarify for them as well. They could potentially identify how many they think they have um, on their site. Um, what they think the age is, because I um, not just the actual data, but what is the perception of age of these buildings? That might speak as to the the maintenance or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, we can absolutely collaborate as a because uh, the subcommittee is taking this on, and Henry's part of that. Andrew. Yes. Um, basically, I just have a comment. I mean, instead of like looking at like a quantitative number, like X percentage of the portable, uh, have we considered using like a more qualitative assessment of the portables and see if they meet certain like basic standards? Because sometimes a, a well-maintained like 15 years old portable may be better than like a 10 years old portable. So, mm. so that's what I'm thinking may have been done anything in terms of like looking at you know, assess all this portable on the on the year to year basis. I Liz, go ahead. You're on mute. There we go. Um, you know, I'd be perfectly willing to visit school sites and, you know, start looking at these buildings, taking pictures, um, you know, kind of <laughs> providing some uh, info, you know, that can be organized and brought up so that we have visuals and, and um, you know, some qualitative assessment that's from an untrained eye, perhaps, but still something to go by. And I'll just say one comment that it, it was, I mean, this is a issue that, you know, the committee has tackled before and not gotten to the end of it. Um, a lot of it is dependent on the numbers to just get a handle of it. Um, so that's why we'd always just stop short at quantitative. Um, there's enough to chew on that way without introducing more variables, but I think it's certainly uh, you know, a direction the committee could take. 
the the and to be clear the the threshold would not be and then x has to be um like physically done it's if the board adopts that recommendation then they have to evaluate it and then of course they would be using qualitative factors to make their determination mm -hmm. look at it and oh go ahead andrew yeah i'm well, i'm saying it if 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 um, FPC is considering looking at it more like a qualitative assessment. I would be more than willing to help with this. This I mean, to go taking pictures and like maybe prepare like a little survey and like a checklist and go and check it out and see if the the portable be certain standards and that we define. Okay, so we are out of time um, unless we extend. Uh, Liz. Uh, I'd like to motion to give us just another minute, please. Oh yeah, I'll take that without objection. All right, seeing no objection, go ahead, Liz. Um, I, I totally welcome uh, some help from Andrew. We could certainly uh, get started on some qualitative uh, work um, because I think ultimately when this comes to the board, they might also appreciate being able to see some of these uh, further assessments, because if there's something blaring, um, they're gonna wanna know. Great, thank you. Uh, Brian. I wanted to attempt to, to wrap up next steps based on what I've heard um, and, and get you know, confirmation. So I think we've asked uh, Kelly to provide the definition of a, uh, of a portable, um, perhaps with some, some examples. Um, I think I heard um, that there, there are at least three factors that the subcommittee should look at, you know, the, the instruction and the configuration of these portables, the uh, maintenance status and the age. And then I think um, and then there are also the, the uh, the teacher survey, and then I think uh, it would. I think the subcommittee definitely would like to meet with staff too on this because I think that will allow us to to move this forward more quickly. So those are the the summarized next steps I have. Liz, is that a you have a follow up? Because we're out of time. But yeah, well, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say we've been talking about going and visiting the campuses and I don't see any reason why we can't start doing that as well. Okay, yeah, and, uh, visiting the campuses, I think, um, was, the other, was the other item that um, was mentioned, you're right. Brian, if you could send me that list of items that you've written down, I tried to track it, but couldn't. Um, but it seemed, it, was there any objection to what, you know, what Brian categorized as action items? Oh, and Kelly's noted that we should coordinate with uh, the office on any visits. We don't want to be confused for the next round of vandals. <laughs> All right. Um, We're not going to have any more of that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll get picked up on the cameras. Um, okay, so we can move to the next item. Um, and these are liaison reports and discussion. Uh, a through C, I imagine, should be pretty relatively short. Um, and so on the facility sub-task force, because of the board's decision to move to distance learning until, um, as of now, there's seven days of no new cases, um, a, a matter that I believe will be reconsidered, um, there, the facility sub-task force has not met uh, what, you know, after presenting its report to the board. Um, I'll update the group if that changes. Um, are there any updates from the MIP uh, task force and SDI task force? Um, this is Sharon. Um, I, Judy, uh, Judy and I both got an email from um, Dr. Rocha this week um, indicating the meeting dates. And so the first meeting for the committee will be um, September 14th, and then she has them laid out through June of uh, 2021. So um, we will start meeting next month. Great. Um, so I think we won't have an update then at that point. Um, 
And then Robert, do you have any update? No, I haven't been informed of anything. Okay, great. And then Judy, is that the same update? Yes. Great. great, thank you. And then I will hand it back to either Brian or Liz to give um, a quick summary or summary of the other items that we looked at. Um, if you recall at the last meeting, you know, we were tasked uh, with continuing our work on the rubric um, while obviously prioritizing the temporary classrooms analysis. So uh, I'll go ahead and uh, give an update. Um, so I have kind of, I've taken all the demographic data and imported it into, into Excel from the Davis demographic report. And, uh, and then I'll, and I took the capacity report and used that for updated um, uh, capacity numbers um, and uh, plugged it all into the rubric. And so uh, the reason we're not showing it now is, is uh, well, twofold. It's not on the agenda, but primarily because the data does need to be vetted more. And I think uh, I need some support from staff on that um, to make sure that we're, we're, we're getting the data in there correctly. But uh, all, all the data has been put in there, and, um, and in the subcommittee, we have started discussing a few, um, uh, a few next steps, but it's still early on. One of the, 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 the challenges I've started to realize is, is really how to present the data uh, in a way that is accessible to more people, I think, is, um, is, is paramount. And, there's, and there are some elements of the rubric that we're starting to discuss as well. Uh, but the data, I mean, the data is so interesting. Um, happy to walk people through it all. Well, I guess without violating the Brown Act, though. Never mind. Anyway, um, but uh, that's the progress we made thus far, and hope that we can make some more progress in the coming coming months. I'm muted. Um, uh, Liz, go ahead. Okay, um, of course, some of the um, rebalancing uh, question um, looks at those schools that are underutilized and those that are um, overcrowded. And, um, and then there were some other factors in there that um, had to do with funding. Um, one of the things that Brian and I spoke about anyway um, was maybe taking out those financial and more subjective questions because that just adds yet another element that can be really tough to chew on. Um, but anyway, that, that, that was my takeaway from some of our discussion. And currently the report has been adopted by the committee, so we would have to come back and propose any changes for the committee to adopt. Um, and yeah, we'll continue our work um, in between meetings on updating that rubric. And I guess I'll add that the, the same work we're doing on temporaries around the data will inform this project as well. So I think um, uh, being, getting the opportunity to do a deep dive with staff on the data uh, will really accelerate all this work. So I would love to schedule that time. Great. Um, and is there anything further? Okay, seeing nothing. Um, we can move to thoughts on future meeting topics. I would like to remind everybody that elections are coming up in September. So please keep that in mind. That should be on the, on the agenda. Brian? So one, one of the topics I've been thinking about as I've been looking through all these numbers is, is that I, I think the district needs to update its long range facilities plan. Um, and um, I think, uh, I, I don't, I mean, I guess I don't have it fully for, framed for, for putting on this agenda, but I think um, uh, perhaps a, dis, a discussion on you know, on what st staff's thinking along those lines, and um, and where uh, where where we could help, um, or where we, we would be a part of that. But I think uh, 
I think that that's a cr critical need that uh, that needs to happen. Do we have consensus? Can I get, since most people have no camera on, um, Liz, could you lower your hand for a second? And, and then. I, I just had a question. Oh, no, I know. I'm going to uh, gauge. Oh, okay. um, could people raise their hands if they're interested in that? In getting a staff update on the long range facilities plan. Okay. Um, all right. If we could, you could lower your hands. Great. Uh, Liz? Uh, yes. I, um, we did have a subcommittee that we formed way early on in 2018 on the long range facility plan. Uh, Brian, myself, uh, I believe Henry, I can look back, and Tara, Tara Henry also, who's of course not with us anymore, but there were five members total. And that may have included you too, Antonio, but um, it would seem we, if we wanting to have five members on there, we may need to see if there's anyone else interested that would be a part of that subcommittee. Got it. Um, please reach out to me, I believe under the bylaws I can appoint and then I have to get the consent of the committee, but I may be uh, recalling incorrectly. So please do reach out to me. Um, we're always looking for volunteers on that. Are there any other items? Antonio, I just have a question. Um, Liz, when you guys participated in that subcommittee, do you guys have minutes or notes from uh, some of the things that you guys uh, raised questions on back then so that I could have a sort of a, a point of reference, but I would love for you all to um, of course, provide me with any information or updates because we are going to be pursuing a request for proposal in September from our architectural pool for the update. And I would love to sort of get ahead of it and have, you know, our concerns already ready to sort of have them dive right in. Right. Uh, actually, the um, long range facility plan subcommittee never did meet. Um, yeah. and, I, and I was just looking at those minutes and it was. Uh, Henry Fung, who was also on there, and Irene Shen. Okay. Uh, Henry. Um, just want to see if, if this committee should also, um, I mean, I'm not sure if the, the district, the, um, the facility task force is still meeting to, to talk about what will happen when school uh, kids are, will go back. Um, I mean, or is it something that this committee should look at as well? I mean, what if um, COVID cases that go down and then we need to start planning for kids to come back? Should this committee should talk about this or is it going to be another committee, the district task force that will be talking about that? So, yeah, that's what I had noted that the sub task, the facility sub task force had stopped meeting after, I don't know, as of a month or two ago, um, probably two ago. It's time is a blur um, given stay at home. Um, there was some talk about potentially restarting it um, at some point in the future. I don't know where that ended up. Um, and then obviously that was the acting superintendent's, um, excuse me, that was the acting superintendent's project. Um, I don't know if uh, our new superintendent will you know, push that forward. Does Trustee Jones have any visibility on that? Um, I don't have the answer to that specifically, but I, I can presume that he, you know, Superintendent Kamek is going to recognize where our needs are and then start making plans to form task forces or, or some other reincarnation of that in order to address that, the possibility that we could come back to campus. Um, but I haven't heard anything specific. Might I add as well, uh, we do have a manager's meeting on Friday, well not Friday, on Thursday, and there's a um, administrative retreat on Thursday afternoon where we're going to be specifically talking about um, these kinds of things that you all are discussing right now. And so hopefully we'll have uh, something to be able to present and um, give to the trustees at the next board meeting and be able to share with you all as well. 
All right, great, thank you. Um, are there any other future meeting topics? If not, I would like to thank um, this committee for meeting all throughout the summer. Um, that's the first time we've done so, and we've, you know, we shoot into some substantive items and we're and are able to hit, you know, the school year running and continue, for example, our discussion on portable classrooms. I think with the answers that we'll have, um, we should be able to, you know, make a formal recommendation to the board, hopefully after this next meeting. So again, I'd like to thank you all for taking time out of your summer. Um, to meet. Outside of that, um, we can adjourn. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate all your time. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you.